good afternoon everybody uh, i hope all of you are doing well and staying safe uh, this afternoon i am going to take up a, a topic which i had already discussed with you the topic uh, is uh, continental shelf uh, this is one of the maritime zones and uh, continental shelf uh, uh, is considered to be a, one of the most important in terms of uh, economic value and uh, for you uh, continental shelf is important because i told you that uh, most of the times in your examination uh, questions may come from continental shelf also uh, so uh, this afternoon i'll be discussing with you uh, some of the cases uh, that i could not discuss last time uh, and uh, so uh, the cases that I uh, discussed with you last time was uh, the uh, continental shelf case between uh, Germany on the one hand and uh, Netherlands and Denmark on the other hand. And I had told you that uh, uh, the continental shelf uh, amongst these three countries uh, were to be divided and uh, it was not so easy. There was a dispute. And uh, that dispute was resolved with the help of International Court of Justice opinion. And uh, in that case, the court had held uh, that a mechanical application of a formula, and the formula was equidistance formula. So if that formula uh, is mechanically applied, that will not give uh, equitable solution. And therefore, what the court had said, that uh, uh, there must be uh, some circumstances, if there are some special circumstances, or if there are some relevant circumstances, which also must be considered, uh, then uh, equidistance line or equidistance uh, line method that is uh, to be adjusted according to the relevant circumstances. Uh, so, I had told you uh, to study that North Sea continental shelf case. Uh, I hope all of you might have studied. And uh, this afternoon, I am going to uh, make you uh, discuss or understand some other cases. And first case that I will discuss is Libya versus Tunisia case. Libya versus Tunisia case is a case which is uh, to be studied by you. It is according to uh, your syllabus. If you can look at your syllabus, this is Libya versus Tunisia continental shelf case. It is uh, given in page number 127 of your study material. And uh, if you look at page number 127 of your uh, study material, you will find that uh, this was a dispute between two countries of Africa, which are uh, adjacent to each other. So Libya is uh, adjacent to Tunisia and uh, both these countries, they have common continental shelf and uh, both these countries, they wanted uh, the continental shelf to be divided according to the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. And uh, Libya wanted that uh, it should not be again uh, the 200 uh, nautical miles and equidistance method, which should be applicable. Uh, but it said that uh, there should be also application of uh, relevant circumstances of a particular country. Uh, similarly, Tunisia, uh, which is uh, relatively a smaller country than Libya uh, but both of them they share the common continental shelf. Uh, Tunisia also agreed that um, the mechanical application of equidistance method uh, is not helpful and uh, Tunisia said that there should be uh, the application of equidistance method uh, but uh, therefore, you look at this uh, paragraph, both parties consider that continental shelf uh, is 
and institution of international law. And uh, thereafter, you'll find that uh, both these parties, they agreed that uh, there should be continental shelf based upon, uh, the delimitation of continental should be based upon uh, the relevant circumstances. And the court dealt with Article 76 uh, and Article 83 of the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. Uh, at that time, it was the draft of the UN Convention because this case was just this case was decided uh, in the year 1980, uh, 1982 itself. So, uh, at that moment of time, uh, it was not finally this UN Convention that was not finally uh, uh, adopted by the international community. So the court referred to Article 76. I had discussed with you Article 76, which uh, talks about uh, the definition of continental shelf as well as uh, the breadth of continental shelf. And Article 83 of UN Convention tells you about that how uh, the continental shelf uh, between adjacent and opposite states that can be delimited. So. Uh, this, uh, these articles were discussed by the court and uh, thereafter in this paragraph you see that the court was concluding that uh, the, what is the meaning of natural prolongation of uh, the continental shelf and what is the meaning of equity. You see this is equity. What is the meaning of equity? Uh, so you should read this judgment and uh, this in this judgment you'll find that both parties wanted the application of equitable principles but parties did not agree on the true concept of natural prolongation and what were relevant circumstances uh, in this case issue was whether a natural prolongation uh, defined scientifically without reference to equitable principles is truly a natural prolongation for the purpose of delimitation. So I told you uh, when I was uh, defining continental shelf, I told you that now continental shelf is defined as the natural prolongation of the landed territory of a state. So if that natural prolongation is a geological fact. That natural prolongation is a natural fact and thereafter the, uh, the dispute even then uh, will be that because this is a common thing, because this is a, a common rock between two adjacent states which is uh, prolonging into the sea and therefore what how this uh, should be delimited. Uh, so this is uh, uh, therefore the court said that this is a uh, scientific and this is very uh, much mechanical natural prolongation is very you know it is a fact and therefore if you do not take the reference to equitable principle uh, then you will not delimit uh, the continental shelf because if you look at article uh, 83 of the UN convention uh, you will find that article 83 is, uh, very clearly says and that equity is very important to reach uh, the result. What is the result? Result is delimitation of continental shelf. So you see that this is uh, Article 83. It says the delimitation between states with opposite or adjacent coasts shall be affected by agreement on the basis of international law in order to achieve an equitable solution. So equitable solution is very important. And here this uh, word was emphasized by the court. It said that equitable solution, how can the countries reach an equitable solution unless a scientific uh, method was not uh, related to the equitable principles. And uh, in this case, the president of International Court of Justice, Justice T.O. Elias, uh, he was from uh, Nigeria, uh, Justice Nagender Singh was from India, and other justices delivered the majority judgment. And this was 
not as sharply divided as uh, the North Sea Continental Shelf case, but it was like 10 uh, judges in favor and four judges against. And uh, uh, the court held that relevant circumstances could include uh, three, four things. First was natural prolongation. And second was geological information about rocks. So uh, how, what is the extent of the rock? Uh, what, is the, uh, what is the age of the rock like that? And thereafter, geographic configuration of coastline. Uh, so coastline is uh, how, what is the length of the coastline? And thereafter, geomorphology. And thereafter, also the court said, land frontier is also important. What is the meaning of land frontier? Land frontier means position of intersection with the coastline. Uh, so the court said that uh, this land frontier should also be a relevant circumstance. And then proportionality. What is the extent of continental shelf area which is appertaining to the coastal state and the length of the coast measured in the general direction of the coastline? So that is called proportionality. The court also held that historic rights deriving from long established fishing activities in the Mediterranean economic consideration, all these will be the relevant circumstances. So uh, uh, relevant circumstances, you have to give uh, consideration while uh, arriving at equitable solution. So, it's very much subjective. Relevant circumstances have become now very much subjective and uh, the court has taken up the role to exactly say that what is the meaning of relevant circumstances. Uh, so uh, in this case, what happened that principle of the court held that principle of equity should be involved both in the process of delimitation and also in its result. And uh, because I have shown you that in Article 83, uh, it says that uh, in Article 83, it says that uh, equitable solution is important. So equitable solution is important and therefore the court said equitable result is more important. In this case, uh, although there was uh, the argument by Tunisia alleging that, that economic considerations uh, 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 must be also given uh, a due importance uh, while considering about relevant circumstances. And in that case, uh, Tunisia also was uh, praying to the court that Tunisia is relatively poor. Uh, it's not as rich as Libya. Uh, Libya had agriculture, minerals, oil and gas, whereas Tunisia had only agriculture and minerals. So on that basis also Libya wanted a little bit more in the continental shelf on the basis of the application of the principle of equity. But court did not accept this contention of Libya. Court said that uh, this, this is not a relevant circumstance. And uh, there, uh, thereafter what happened that uh, the court uh, fixed uh, the, uh, the median line, the, the, the provisional median line, and thereafter it adjusted the provisional median line uh, with the relevant circumstances, which were in this case, and there, if you, I, I will just show you the map in this case, what will be the relevant circumstance. You see, this is Libya. So Libyan coast is like this. So it's not uh, concave or it's not zigzag. So this will be not very much important. Uh, and But then Tunisia's coast is little bit zigzag and it is also like, a little bit uh, looking like a bay, small kind of bay. Uh, so, uh, so naturally there was a little bit of possibility that uh, the provisional median line will be tendered, uh, tendered uh, uh, against Tunisia. So, so you see, this is the this is the equidistance line. So, if equidistance line would have been adopted, uh, this equidistance line will have to be adopted. Then, what would happen that? Uh, Tunisia would have got uh, this much of uh, area and Libya would have got a little bit less area but Libya wanted the application of 
uh, relevant circumstances in which it said that Libya's uh, continental shelf uh, is more solid and it is going more into the uh, into the sea uh, a Mediterranean Sea. This is Mediterranean Sea, and therefore, what Libya was contending that uh, all these things should be considered as uh, the relevant circumstance. So, uh, so this is a case which uh, you should study. And what happened that in 1988, Libya and Tunisia both implemented the judgment of International Court of Justice, uh, in which the court had said that. This will be the uh, new uh, method of delimitation. This will be the line. Uh, this will be the median line, adjusted median line, in fact. So this will be the adjusted median line, and uh, according to which uh, this uh, delimitation will be affected. So uh, you should uh, study this case. And uh, there was also, uh, like, like, likewise, there was a case between Libya and Malta and uh, Malta is again a country which is uh, situated opposite to Libya. So Tunisia was situated uh, adjacent to Libya and Malta is situated opposite to Libya. And Libya was having a maritime dispute uh, with Malta also. But Malta, compared to Libya and Malta, Libya is a large country and Malta is an island, island country. So in this case, what happened that Libya again wanted the application of equitable principles, whereas Malta uh, wanted also the application of equitable principles, uh, but the Maltese uh, uh, relevant equitable principles were economic factors and security, and also relative poverty. But the court in this case again rejected Malta's uh, contention about relative poverty of Malta. But uh, it had included uh, the fact that Malta's, uh, Malta is a small island state and therefore uh, there was a little bit of adjustment made in the uh, provisional median line, uh, which was the equidistance, which was on the basis of equidistance method. So a little bit technical. Uh, all these things what I'm saying, this is a little bit technical because uh, the continental shelf is all about a little bit of knowledge of geography, geomorphology uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, about uh, the hydrography. All these things uh, will be important. Uh, but it is also interesting. It is interesting not only because uh, it is the whole sea is blue, but also because of the fact that uh, that uh, it has huge economic potential. Continental shelf has huge economic potential. Now I'll be moving on to the next case, which is uh, uh, between India and Bangladesh. And this was the dispute regarding the Bay of Bengal maritime area. And uh, what happened that, as you all know, that Bangladesh is relatively a new country and uh, initially it was part of Pakistan and uh, uh, when Bangladesh became a new country uh, in the 70s and thereafter what happened that the border between India and Bangladesh that was to be uh, made clear and I have uh, discussed with you in the class Teen Bigha case etc in which these boundary disputes also came before the Supreme Court of India. Uh, so maritime disputes uh, are also one of the kind of disputes and uh, this uh, was the dispute regarding delimitation of different maritime zones in Bay of Bengal between India and Bangladesh. And Bangladesh instituted proceedings against India in 2009 uh, regarding the delimitation of maritime areas uh, up to uh, 200 nautical miles and even beyond 200 nautical miles. Uh, so if you look at this arbitration, uh, I have uh, shared with you uh, the arbitration uh, order of Permanent Court of Arbitration. And if you uh, look at this case, this is the judgment. You see, this is the judgment 
this is the order uh, the tribunal's order in the in the matter of the bay of bengal maritime boundary arbitration between people's republic of bangladesh and the republic of india uh, so if you look at this case uh, both parties had agreed that uh, the land boundary terminus right so like the interstate bus terminus isbt land boundary terminus so whatever is the land boundary terminus of india and uh, bangladesh that should be used as a starting point of the maritime boundary between them so both parties agreed on this very thing uh, so this, this was very good uh, and both parties also agreed that the land boundary terminus was established according to the radcliffe award radcliffe award you might be knowing about on that award and that award was the basis of india and pakistan land border uh, demarcation and uh, in the eastern sector so both these parties agreed that land boundary terminus uh, would be established according to radcliffe award but they did not agree about the location of this terminus this point land boundary terminus uh, so this was one very important uh, 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 part of the argument of uh, bangladesh uh, and uh, also india and then bangladesh also argued that its coastline is concave and uh, its coastline is unstable there are many rivers and estuaries uh, deltas uh, there between india and bangladesh uh, although bangladesh is uh, surrounded with such kind of uh, water bodies uh, you might have seen a new uh, series on netflix that was that is uh, extraction in which uh, the in which little bit about the geographical feature of bangladesh uh, that is also uh, depicted so uh, what bangladesh was saying that its coastline is concave and its coastline is unstable uh, and therefore it uh, requested the permanent court of arbitration to apply the relevant circumstances or these special circumstances of bangladesh and not uh, equidistance method to delimit the territorial waters it also raised the issue that the fishing community uh, in bangladesh uh, their their life their lives are dependent upon uh, the fishes which are found in the territorial waters and uh, they go uh, according to uh their long established uh, right to go for fishing india on the other hand wanted the median line simplicity it said that no uh, because of the fact that this uh, relevant circumstance or special circumstances rule uh, which have been uh, promulgated or which have been made as a precedent by international court of justice in libya versus uh, malta Uh, so the india's contention wa was that uh, median line is the transparent method uh, median line is the uh, objective method it's not as subjective as the relevant circumstances method and therefore india wanted a very simple rule to be applied by the permanent court of arbitration and it said that median line should be adopted equidistance method should be adopted and uh, the provisional line should not be adjusted now these were the arguments which were made by india on, and on behalf of india it was argued by the attorney general the then attorney general now he is not more uh, so justice gulam bahanwati was there and uh, india's agent neeru chadha uh, who is now the judge in international tribunal of the law obviously that we will discuss later on so uh, what happened that these were the uh, arguments and what happened that the tribunal which was composed of judges from different countries including india 
came from India, a judge was uh, Justice P.C. Rao. And uh, what happened that the tribunal gave effect to the Radcliffe map. The map which was prepared by Radcliffe uh, that was uh, submitted to the, uh, to the permanent court as an evidence that was given effect to by the Permanent Court of Arbitration to locate the land boundary terminus and rejected Bangladesh contention uh, to apply the special circumstance or relevant circumstance rule regarding concave coastline to delimit territorial shelf. The court held that uh, in the territorial uh, sea, there is no need of uh, adjustment of the provisional medium because territorial sea is a very small area. It's 12 nautical miles only. And therefore in 12 nautical miles, how much we will adjust. So it is not a relevant circumstance to delimit the territorial waters between two countries, two adjacent countries. So concavity of coastline is not a relevant circumstance to delimit the coast, uh, the, the territorial sea. But concave coastline, the court held, that concave coastline may be relevant in the delimitation of continental shelf, but not territorial sea. Uh, but finally what happened that the court of arbitration adjusted the median line with the land boundary terminus due to special circumstance and uh, the Bangladesh Bangladesh uh, contention that the uh, median line should not be the me proper method, but it should be adjusted. So that was also given effect to by the permanent court of arbitration. It said that land boundary terminus uh, will be the uh, also relevant factor. Uh, and therefore median, the provisional median line will be adjusted with the land boundary terminus. As far as uh, the contention of Bangladesh that many people, many fishing communities were dependent upon fishing, uh, on that, uh, all the arguments were raised and Bangladesh took the help of uh, Anglo-Norwegian fisheries case in which uh, Norway had uh, uh, taken up, raised this issue and also uh, had clinched the matter in its favor from the International Court of Justice. But in this case, Permanent Court of Arbitration was not convinced by Bangladesh contention regarding the dependence of, of fishing on fishing by the fishing communities. Uh, so the court held that Bangladesh could not produce sufficient evidence on this issue. So uh, finally, what happened that uh, the Permanent Court of Arbitration, it, uh, it uh, uh, gave, this, gave this ruling and uh, thereafter what happened that this this is this is the picture of uh, all the agents and uh, councils of both the countries and the judges so in the front row are the judges and thereafter these are the agents and councils and thereafter all the other councils and other officials of permanent court of arbitration um, regarding this case so you look at uh, these Faces. These are the arbitrators. He is the arbitrator from India, and uh, she is now the uh, sorry. She is now the judge of the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, Neeru Chadha. So, uh, so you should uh, read this case. And uh, now, uh, what I'll be taking up, I'll be now taking up the next case, which is, which is South China arbitration. Uh, South China Sea arbitration and uh, this is important uh, case uh, I, ha I have not added into your uh, syllabus but uh, next time this will be in your syllabus so uh, just for the sake of interest and just for the sake of making uh, the whole issue of continental shelf and exclusive economic zone uh, uh, relevant, relevant for you uh, I, I will be discussing South China Sea arbitration. Now, as you all know that uh, South China Sea has become a very, very important place in the, uh, in the uh, whole earth because of the fact that South China Sea uh, over that uh, many countries 
they think that this is a very important place because uh, it's a it's a trade route, important trade route connecting many countries of the world, and therefore many countries uh, think that uh, this should be free from the influence of one country, uh, and uh, therefore. Uh, uh, this has happened that somehow it has happened that uh, earlier Taiwan uh, was having control over uh, South China Sea. Uh, but after uh, Japan uh, uh, defeated Taiwan, uh, thereafter what happened that Japan was controlling the South China Sea for a long time. And uh, after Japan was defeated in the Second World War, and thereafter, in Washington, a treaty was signed after which Japan uh, lost all claims over South China Sea. And thereafter, uh, you all know that People's Republic of China came up. And, uh, um, and what happened that People's Republic of China wanted to claim uh, the, its rights over South China Sea. And uh, you might have heard about uh, nine dash line so nine dash line uh, so you know dashes so dash and so all there are nine dashes uh, on south china see i'll just show you the map so so that you will understand it properly so this is the map uh, of uh, south china sea you look at it and uh, this is south china sea this is china and you see how many countries are there uh, so and uh, this is uh, this is you know vietnam and this is malaysia this is philippines and uh, thereafter this is malaysia uh, so this is how you see that this part of the south china sea is uh, uh, is important and uh, what happened that philippines you see this is philippines and uh, philippines uh, was uh, under the control of United States for a long time and uh, it has a kind of American culture in Philippines. So what happened that uh, Philippines uh, moved to this permanent court of arbitration questioning the historic rights claimed by China. China was claiming historic rights over South China Sea on the basis of nine dash line because it was asserting that nine dash line was uh, there and uh, the policy makers of china they had uh, put these uh, dashes nine dashes and uh, on the basis of that it wanted to claim all the dash point dash points uh, which were uh, put by the chinese policy makers uh, so uh, so Philippines questioned this historic rights which were claimed by China. Philippines also questioned China's assertion of 200 nautical miles EZ around Spratly Islands and other islands like Parsley Islands uh, and many there are many other islands in South China Sea. So Philippines questioned this uh, uh, China's assertion of uh, 200 more than 200 nautical miles is it around this uh, Spratly Island also. China was accused of building artificial islands and military installations around the reefs of Spratly Islands and uh, as you all know that uh, this Spratly Island uh, is very famous because uh, it is close to Philippines also and, uh, and there was a time when Spratly Islands were used for, as a strategic islands. Uh, so Philippines questioned China's assertion of 200 nautical. So what China had done, China had uh, built artificial islands around Spratly Island to control Spratly Island and also to install the military uh, structure there. So, uh, Spratly Island is considered as a strategic, I told you, it is a strategic island. So, China wanted to use this uh, strategic location of this island. 
so therefore what happened that philippines wanted that what is the meaning of uh, such kind of islands and uh, whether it is island which is uh, which is having its own ez uh, and uh, if it is not an island if it just if it is just a rock then it will not have its own ez uh, so i have not discussed with you ez uh, so first of all uh, i will discuss the exclusive economic zone and uh, then only perhaps this case will be uh, uh, better understood by you so let us first of all discuss uh, exclusive economic zone and then i will come on come back to this uh, case south china sea now exclusive economic zone is a zone which is uh, adjacent to uh, the contiguous zone and uh, if you look at the definition of uh, exclusive economic zone in the un convention on the law of the sea you will find that article 55 of uh article 55 of the un convention on the law of the sea that defines the exclusive economic zone so you look at this article 55 and you will find how is it defined uh, it says that ez is an area beyond and adjacent to the territorial sea subject to the specific legal regime established in this part under which the rights and jurisdiction of coastal state and the rights and freedoms of other states are governed by the relevant provisions of this convention so a uh, exclusive economic zone is that area of maritime uh, maritime waters which is beyond but adjacent to territorial sea and then what are the rights of the coastal state the rights of the coastal state in the eez is that it has the sovereign rights for the purpose of exploring and exploiting conserving and managing all the natural resources whether living or non living of the waters which are super adjacent to the seabed and of the seabed and its subsoil and it will exploit the zone such as production of energy from the water currents and winds so article 56 tells about the sovereign rights of the coastal state regarding exploration and exploitation of all natural resources thereafter uh, paragraph b of paragraph 1 of article 56 says that to exercise such jurisdiction uh, for the purpose of exploration and exploitation of natural resources the coastal state has the jurisdiction to establish artificial islands and use those artificial islands to establish installations and structures and it also says that the coastal state has the right to go for marine scientific research in the area eez area and it further says that it has the right to protect and preserve the marine environment in eez and thereafter it says that any other rights and duties which are provided for in this convention so you will find that article 56 of the un convention on the law of the sea that gives very important rights sovereign rights on the coastal state regarding the exploration and exploitation of uh, the natural resources in that maritime area what about the breadth of the eez it says that the breadth of eez shall not extend beyond 200 nautical miles from the baselines from which the breadth of the territorial sea is measured so what is the breadth of eez the breadth of eez is maximum 
200 nautical miles. Now, what are the rights and duties of other states? That is given in Article 58. It says all other states, whether coastal or landlocked, they will enjoy all the freedoms of navigation and overflight and laying of submarine cables and pipelines. And thereafter, all those freedoms uh, which are mentioned in Article 57. So, EASY uh, also gives rights to the coast, other states uh, and all other states, they have the right to lay down cables and pipelines and they will go uh, by ship and also they can use the aircraft over the sea. So these are some of the things uh, which you must know if you want to understand about exclusive economic zone. And uh, uh, so on this basis, what I told you, what I was telling you in the context of South China Sea was that China was claiming a 200 nautical miles uh, of EZ, not from its baseline from, the, from its mainland coast, but it was claiming a separate EZ for Spratly Island, which is far away from the mainland China. You see, this is, uh, you see, this is uh, the South China Sea. And if you look at this is Spratly Island. So th these are Spratly Islands. And you see, this is the mainland China. So this is, suppose if this is this uh, uh, southern part of China from that, how far is Spratly Islands? So uh, this was how uh, what uh, Philippines contended before Permanent Court of Arbitration that this is not fair. China's nine dash line is not fair. It is not according to the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. And it questioned that how can Spratly Islands give a separate EZ to China? Uh, because uh, the contention of Philippines was that Spratly Island does not possess high tide features. And uh, according to Article 121, Paragraph 1 of UN Convention on the Law of Sea, a high tide feature may be a simple rock or a full-fledged uh, island. And if, if it is a full-fledged island, then it is capable of uh, generating its own easy and continental shelf. So if you look at uh, UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, you will find that Article 121 it lays down uh, some important provisions about uh, the regime of islands. Because uh, islands, I have told you about Spratly Islands. Article 121 is about the regime of islands. It says that uh, rocks which cannot sustain human habitation or economic life of their own shall have no exclusive economic zone or continental shelf. So this is very important. So rocks. Island, regime of islands, and first of all, it says island is a naturally formed area of land surrounded by water, which is above water at high tide. So high tide, uh, even when high tide will come, even thereafter, the islands will be above, much above it. And uh, thereafter, it says that the territorial sea, contiguous zone, easy continental shelf of an island are determined in accordance with the provisions of this convention applicable to other land uh, territory. So what Philippines was contending that uh, Spratly Islands does not possess high tide features and uh, therefore it is not capable of having its own EZ uh, and continental shelf. So the court had to look at these things and uh, what the court said that high tide feature may be a simple rock or a full-fledged island capable of generating and uh, se generating separate easy and continental shelf. Uh, and then the court held that island covers all portions of territory which are permanently above water in normal circumstances. And to uh, to get to know that what is uh, what is uh, the high tide feature and how can it be permanently above water in normal circumstances? The court held that nautical charts, records of surveys, 
sailing directions, all these things may be relevant evidence. And then the court held that if the natural condition of a feature can sustain human habitation or economic life on its own, according to Article 121, Paragraph 3, then only that will be called island. Otherwise, this will be simply a rock. And the court held Spratly Islands are not islands, but they are rocks. And rocks can have only territorial waters, uh, but islands can have its own exclusive economic zone as or maybe continental shelf. As far as the question of nine dash line was concerned, the court held that nine dash line is not uh, appropriate because UN Convention does not recognize such kind of uh, vague, uh, vague delimitation. Uh, like these are all dashes, so nine dashes. And the court also held that it was not earlier uh, nine dash, it was earlier 11 dashes. So uh, how these 11 dash dashes were reduced to nine dashes. So that was also, so it was all, you know, uh, very much subjective and it all depended upon China's, uh, China's uh, intentions uh, at different points of time. So there was a time when Zhao and Lai uh, had uh, reduced 11 dash line to nine dash line uh, after, uh, after Taiwan was having claim over on this is Spratly Islands. So, uh, when the question of historic rights of China over Spratly Islands uh, due to the assertion of nine dash line for a long time, uh, the, as far as this question was concerned, uh, the Permanent Court of Arbitration uh, was saying that uh, this is creating no historic title. And it was very clear Permanent Court of Arbitration held that UN Convention, the law of the sea, allows no space for historic rights. And then it said that China's claims of historic rights cannot be sustained and therefore it rejected the nine dash line as creating uh, the economic sphere, the maritime, maritime zone of China. So you see that many disputes have arisen on maritime uh, area delimitation and uh, this is a very important topic as you know that uh, the maritime areas have a lot of potential, economic potential as well. And therefore, uh, what I was uh, trying to uh, discuss with you that you must try to uh, get uh, to understand all these different complexities of the delimitation as well as the nature of rights and duties of coastal states as well as the third states in different maritime zones. So today I will be concluding up to this point. And when we meet next, I will discuss uh, International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea as a forum to settle, uh, uh, settle international uh, disputes. Uh, so till then, uh, have a safe